bringing the attention to uh, Pachubana Dhamma here and now. In the sense of opening, relaxed, opening, receptivity. So seeing meditation then in terms of instead of something you have to do which can create this sense of I've got to get something I don't have and then we if we think I've got to meditate in order to get rid of stress or this this way of thinking uh, can be counterproductive and becomes another thing we have to do So, like uh, Lung Po Cha's description of a meditation as holiday for the heart, resting the resting the mind, Pak Pon Tang Jit Jai, that's the Thai. So, this is Lung Po Cha's definition of meditation. These are worth, worth considering, you know, contemplating, and how we hold meditation or practice is to see whether this arouses this kind of compulsive uh, striving tendency, which is so common in the Western world, kind of we're programmed into goal, uh, achieving goals. <coughs> so our cultural conditioning is very kind of goal-oriented, of attaining getting rid of and attaining. So this is where like opening to the way it is, you're beginning to just notice the be aware of these tendencies, compulsive tendencies or obsessive tendencies. Feeling there's something you've got to do, you've got to get. Uh, you've got to get rid of anger, get rid of bad thoughts, And so then this is putting yourself into that position of the puto, the, the, the knowing position, of being aware, open, receptive to this habit, because this is a habit tendency. This is an ultimate reality. You know, this is not a refuge to, to uh, attach to. Now, speaking from experience, because I certainly understand the problem, being having that problem myself, so it's not theory, but just pointing as aware of the, this compulsiveness of thought and this kind of inner feeling of something I've got to do, something lacking, something I've got to get that I don't have. It's a kind of feeling that, that drives one pushes one around or I've got to get rid of things there's certain weaknesses or bad habits that I've got to get rid of I've got to eradicate them extirpate them resonate them kill them off now that's um these, these, these two extremes, indulgence and suppression, are in the Tamajaka Pavatana Sutta, Gama Sukalikanu Yoka, Atakina Matanu Yoka. Like looking for happiness is always, you know, in the world, seeking happiness is our goal in the world. Or seeking to annihilate what we don't like, to control, get rid of, deny, suppress. <clears throat> so happiness as a goal, I mean, we have happiness, but as a goal, it's, it's unsatisfying. 
it's momentary, it's not, you can't sustain it for very long. So that means one's always looking for something, you know, always losing it and having to try to find it again. <clears throat> so once you've, you've achieved happiness, you can't keep it, so then your life is spent seeking, trying to get it back or get more. So, this is the problem of the conditioned attachment to the conditioned realm. The Sankata Dhamma. These Pali words, Sankata is like conditioned. Asankata is unconditioned. So, there's a, there's a lesson in Pali grammar. <laughs> The R sound is the negative. And uh, Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu, in, when he was alive in, in his monastery, some of you have been there to Suan Mok in Suratani province, uh, he's always presenting kind of enigmatic poly words to reflect upon. And the last one he came up with is uh, Atamiyata. That's a very interesting word, and it means at, uh, atam is not that, you know, ah is a neg- negation, not that. Maya, which is created or compounded or concocted, state of being, da, it always uh, means a kind of state of being. So, not that concocted state of being. So it's a neg- negation, isn't it? It points to this, this, uh, it's not that, it's not this thought, this thoughts are compounded, aren't they? We concoct thinking, we create it, or feeling, you know, or, or, uh, emotion. The body, it's a creation, it, it comes and goes. This is a word, but it, it's for reflection, for contemplation, not that maya, or uh, of maya is defined as illusion. So when we live in, in a world of illusions, and this is a concocted state, isn't it? We, we create a world to live in. So I can create my own world, you know, how my view, my opinion, my feelings, where I as a person am the center, my sensitivity, all this, and and this my is a concocted sense of self. I see myself through, through compounding things. through my personality. My personality becomes my center. So I'm giving this personality, uh, uh, empowering it, you know, to live life. And then it becomes, uh, you know, it's it's all frustrated, uh, ambitious, angry, greedy, confused, obsessed, compulsive, Neurotic, mad, you know, <laughs> so that, that this is a, this is the compounding of this moment. So I mean, it's interesting. It's the gr- grammar of not that. The point. It's the pointing at. It's not not a kind of. What do you say? An abstraction pointing to some abstract definition of the unconditioned, but it's more like a direct pointing. To say, not that, it's not this body, not that thought or feeling, emotional power. 
So when you when you reflect in this way, you know, then you you're using this sati sampachanya, which is not personal. It's not it's not a part of one's personality. <coughs> it's functional. It's here and now. It's natural. What isn't concocted? What isn't it? What is it at this moment? You're not making up. When I start thinking about myself, my feelings and my views and opinions and my life and my worth and all that, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm creating something. All kinds of things about me as a person, as a human being, as a monk, and so forth, and then it, it becomes, it's a concoction of my mind, isn't it? I create that. And yeah, I can be com- totally committed, you know, if I'm not aware, I can be totally committed to, to myself, my view the way I think. So you get fanatics, don't you? Religious fanatics or political fanatics who are committed to their own views. Racist views or political views or religious views. Kill the infidels or burn the heretics kind of views. These are concoctions of the mind. Because when when you don't create anything in the present, when you just trust in the awareness, you know you begin to you you're reaching that axis mundi. You're beginning to rest in that natural place of being, in the atamiyata. That which you're not creating, compounding. So in this, it's natural. In in English words, it's it's a natural state, not created. This is important to, to, to reflect upon, you know, like, Refined concentration depends on conditions, supporting on refined conditions. Atamyada doesn't isn't 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 seeking uh, special conditions because it, it doesn't depend. It's not its creation. It's its manifestation. It is not. It doesn't manifest. It isn't a, something that you can make, you know, by refining conditions, but something you recognize. So then there's Nibbana, You know, in in uh, Thailand, it like uh, the Lumpur Cha Putadasa always when asked about what is Nibbana, he said the reality of non-attachment. Reality of non-attachment. It's not like where sometimes the word itself, because it's a rather beautiful word in its own right, sounds you know sublime. And, uh, and can be interpreted as some kind of high heavenly state. <clears throat> but in, in uh, terms of scriptural use, and, and it's the reality, the realization of non-attachment. So that's why in uh, Paticca Samupada, or dependent origination, you, you're really studying attachment before you can 
realize non-attachment, you have to know what attachment is. You know, again, one, one can kind of live in a spacey world of I shouldn't be attached to anything as a kind of wish. But that's not it. It's not going around trying to pretend you're not attached to anything. It's, you know, in Paticca Samupada, you're really observing the process that leads to attachment, ignorance, that influences sankhara, isn't it? mental formations. It, it, it has its effect on, on, on uh, consciousness. And then, which takes us to when we, when desire rises, which leads to desire and and attachment. So this upadana or clinging attachment, you know, is something to really uh, reflect on. Not just say you shouldn't be, make some kind of statement about how you shouldn't be attached because that's not it it's not about, not a, a matter of believing and then judging oneself from an ideal of non-attachment but recognizing attachment so then once you recognize the problem you can let go you can't let go of something that's theoretical or idealistic so <clears throat> this is very practical then. So if I'm, I recognize upadana in myself, you know, when I'm obsessed with that, if I'm upset, you know, the dukkha, if, uh, you know, I feel personally threatened or, or whatever, uh, or if I feel overwhelmed or upset or angry or Whatever I, I become, you know, I I go to that place where, where I'm suffering. So that, that that's putting us back into the paradigm of the noble truth: attachment to desire. Take an interest in attachment, you know, study it, you know, admit it. You know, a lot of, I found a lot of attachments around my sense of my personality, my ego. You know, not wanting to look bad, uh, feeling threatened by somebody, um, not wanting to lose face, not wanting, uh, you know, fearing somebody else might harm me or humiliate me. Um, all kinds of fears around this. Just, uh, because the ego, you know, it, the attachment to this sense of a self as a person. Wanting to be right, isn't it? The ego, you know, I'm right, my view is right. And uh, insisting on being right the obsession about I have to be right all the time. And so then if you don't agree with me, then you're wrong.
And then the anxiety about maybe you're right and I'm not, and the ego goes into a kind of problem there of, of doubt and worry. <clears throat> Things like this is the, the conceit, arrogance, uh, the ego, and in all its, you know, egos aren't necessarily bad. They, they can be quite pleasant, good too. So, but they're created. You know, so it's not. So that that when we attach to those compounded creations, concoctions. Then we're, you know, then the result is this dukkha, because there's something missing. It's true, there is something missing, some lack. <clears throat> so that's why this going back to the center, to the axis mundi, to the still point of the turning wheel, to the unshakable, thought of awareness. So you see this the escape from samsara is always here and now. It's uh, this this is not something you know that uh, you you have to attain. It's it's a real realization. So in realizing Nibbana is realizing the peace that comes from non-attachment. You know, if you, if you, if you rest, if you know what attachment is, not through definition, but through observing your own witnessing to attachment and then the result of attachment, then there is a natural movement of letting go. You know, you, one doesn't hold on to pain if there's a way, if there's a way of letting go of it. Or do, you, you know, like desire is, is, uh, synonymous to fire. You don't burn yourself intentionally anymore. No need to suffer for no reason once you realize the causes. So then, non-suffering is the eightfold path. You know, just putting it in simpler to eightfold sounds a bit complicated, but non-suffering, the way of non-suffering, then is here and now, isn't it? It's not you know, something you have to attain, the Eightfold Path. But it's, it's a, it's, uh, these Four Noble Truths are pointing always to this present moment. The path is right now, it's not something you, you will get through doing a lot of meditation in the future. It's being, to wreck, to trust in that reality of knowing, of being aware. Atamayata, not not that made up thing, not that creation, not that concoction. So anatta also, you know, you can say anatata, the state of no, not that self, no self. Atta is is uh, self, and anatta is no self. Da is state of being. So you, anatta da is a state of no self. So then you you know your awareness is then tuning in. You kind of tuning into reality rather than than you know making up making it up. Reality is now, it's not, not something, you know, you don't create reality. So in uh, 
the third noble truth, the realization, the realization of cessation. When conditions cease, when the self ceases, You realize, well, this is it. This is real. Yeah, this. You know, so it's a, it's a state of attentiveness rather than of discovering some condition that, that you, you, you identify with. There's nothing to identify, is it? In, the, in cessation, you don't become someone who's realized cessation. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a recognition. It's, this is it. No self. And in the path, Eightfold Path, the Samaditi, of course, right view. You have the right, you see things in the right way now. Or sometimes sama is, is uh, the word sama diti sama sama is uh, usually translated as right, but some people have even used perfect, perfect view. What is a perfect view? And is it is it a thought, some kind of? Can you make a per? Is sama diti some kind of conception? Or is it an understanding, a profound understanding, intuitive understanding of reality? <laughs> because it's very clear the Buddha didn't leave a lot of uh, the doctrines to bind ourselves to. You know, the basis is uh, bases for um, thinking and uh, and and uh, compounding upon. And then there's always, in the Theravada school, it's always like, every time you try to grasp some kind of, make some dogmatic statement out of Buddhism, it's, you know, it's just, it's kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't work very well. <coughs> Because you notice the Buddha pointed to suffering, not to a metaphysical thing. The, the reality of the deathless is realized not through defining it, but pointing. So it's a kind of opposite of other religious approaches where, you, where the Buddha points to a kind of ordinary common human experience of suffering. Through exploring, investigating, we realize the deathless, the unconditioned. So it remains in that state of, of negation, unconditioned. I don't know if deathless is a, is a neg negation. <laughs> Immortal. uncompounded, uncreated. And you notice how negation works on your mind. You know, the, this is grammar, but the, when you negate something, it's, there is a kind of sense of, you know, it can be annihilation or it can be, in terms of reflection, it's, it's uh, liberation. Because when we try to bind ourselves, usually positively with I am the ultimate truth or I am this or that or then it and then it easily uh, builds into into com into concocting something again so in uh, the kind of via negativa approach you know because this is how how language works how it affects consciousness 
They recognize the Buddha's teachings are always pointing at the here and now, at reality. They're not theoretical, uh, specula- uh, philosophical speculation. So this is where it's it's uh, you know it's, you're encouraged to to um, to explore this. And like when you become samanas, you know you monks and nuns and that you're you're kind of given this imprimatur to to use the system fully. You know it's kind of giving the blessings of the sangha to use the teaching the Dhamma of India. It's agreed on by the Sangha, you know, with the blessing of the Sangha. So it has a lot of power, you know, monastic form. Not to become Buddhist monk or Buddhist nun or, or uh, you know, that. that's not the point. Or to kind of browbeat you into conformity and, and kind of institutionalize you in a monastic system it, it, you know this this is this is kind of given the right and the encouragement to use the convention fully for awareness, not for attachment. And the problem lies, of course, in in how we use the conventions. So, you know, at first we tend to, you know, with what we know from the conditioning of our mind, until we've we've had these insights, had this insight, then we do operate from oftentimes, you know, the, the monastic identity, and we create, you know, becomes part of our ego. So if one doesn't really investigate the Four Noble Truths, then, you know, one can use use the system, uh, you know, to create more identities, more delusions. So this is this is where, you know, it's up to each one. One can't force someone to be undi- undiluted. Uh, not even though, you know, I can say, don't be deluded and all that. And, uh, uh, tell you, you know, how, how you, you know, the actual awakening is something only you can do yourself. And if I keep frightening you, you know, I keep shouting at you, don't be deluded. Be mindful, and then you, you know, that's, that's it's true. You know, I'm telling you something true and right, but but maybe I'm doing it in a way that, that you, it just frightens you. Every time you see me, here comes that old guy, you know, he's going to tell me not to be deluded anymore. <laughs> no, it, you know, it's not. You know, if I if I come across as a real heavy, you know, uh, you know, um, authoritarian teacher, then that you know, just that energy of me telling you uh, can can be quite an obstruction. This is where it's you know the. uh, This is where the encouragement is to really recognize, like waking up, attention, mindfulness, something you know, you know, you can can recognize in yourself. You can realize it yourself. You don't need me to tell you. (laughs) 
And to take that, build that confidence in your awareness rather than say, you know, putting all your confidence in me because I'm, I'm your teacher so I know what you need. And that, kind of, that tends to, to put the onus back onto somebody else outside yourself. See, so it's, it's really, it's learning to trust in awareness. To recognize it, to to treasure it, it's 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 the the gate to the deathless. It's the way out, you know. It's something. It's there is a way out of this this concocted realm we're living in, this realm of dukkha. There is a way out of it, which is not a destructive way. We're not destroying the world or condemning it. We're knowing. You know, we're, we're liberating ourselves not by rejecting it, but by understanding it, knowing it. So it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a annihilationist teaching at all. It's not like Armageddon or destroying conditioned phenomena because, you know, we, we, we uh, we see it as deluding, killing the witches, burning the witches, killing the infidels. <coughs> Not that kind of. That's an annihilationist attitude. The United States uh, getting rid of the terrorists, annihilating all the terrorists. The focuses of evil. <laughs> Very frightening, actually. <laughs> now, evil is, you know, once you you don't destroy it, you you know it. You know, so like anger, hatred. <clears throat> fears and things are to be understood you know then they then they they no longer you know they that we have to learn from that not by following those conditions but by recognizing them so anger hatred all that is is like this you know when it when the conditions are present then this is what i'm feeling so, but this is not my refuge anymore. It's a, it's an opportunity. It's an occasion for uh, understanding. Because this realm is like this, you know. It's irritating. There's so many. It's, it's good and bad. It's light and dark, it's beautiful and ugly, it's all these things, all the conditioned phenomena is dualistic. You know, so it if you have one you have the other. If you have light you have dark and on and on like this. So if you have right you have wrong, good and evil. They're a pair, you know. They go together. Notice that, that that this is uh, this is just the way it is, because you know these concepts, dualistic thinking and concepts, is a divisive function of the mind. It's it's uh, discriminative. Uh, you know, when you think, you're dividing things. If I'm thinking me, then that makes me very separate from you. I'm clinging to the fact of me, then I feel, you know, you as something very separate. Or if I'm attached to I'm right and you don't agree, then you're wrong. You know, so there's a division there. 
God is on my side and, not, and you're on the side of the devil. So this is, this is, because this limitation of thinking, thoughts, you know, are like that. They're not, it's not, uh, you can't liberate yourself through thinking. So in the, in the awareness, you know, is the, is the gate to the deathless. Atamiyata. Now, in terms of skillful use of thought, not, you know, I'm not saying, you know, saying one shouldn't think anymore. I think it's part of our life. It's it's, uh, you know, it's something that can be used skillfully. <clears throat> but as an attachment, like when we create, you know, when we create worlds, uh, you know, compound, concoct things, concoct ourselves, it's through thinking, through remembering, attachment to memories, views, assumptions we have about ourselves. And so then I become this person. If you stop thinking, you recognize or realize the gap between thoughts before thought arises. Thought is always concocted, isn't it? It comes and goes. It's not absolute. It's obviously very, you know, it's a, it's a function of the mind. And yet we can be so bound into thinking that we, we have no perspective on it. You know, someone has this think, think, think problem. And then the obsessions around oneself. <clears throat> so, so then this is, this awareness is, it, is transcends thinking. You know, so you're, you're really l recognizing this awareness. And thinking as an object then, rather than the subject. So, in the sati sampachanya, sati panya, this is, these words are pointing at that reality. Bhuto, pointing at this reality. So then, say, in developing the path, simplification helps simplify your lives. You know, so, you know, trying to, you know, we can, you know, the life, modern life can be, you know, people complain about stress all the time. They feel stressed. Because their life is, is very speedy now. It's, uh, you know, kind of out of touch with natural rhythms. We can live in completely artificial environments now. <coughs> you know, so we, you know, we are quite comfortably in, in everything that, that, uh, and, but to sustain this, it takes a lot of work and makes our lives uh, complicated. Because even though we have, we're not, you know, bound to just washing the clothes in the river anymore, we, we we occupy ourselves with other things. Since we don't have to spend that much time doing the laundry, we can do all kinds of other things. That are artificial. You know, at least when you're washing your clothes in the river, there's something quite you know, it's it it can be very done very mindfully. It's quite a natural thing to be doing. But then, oh, I don't have time to do that anymore. I need an electric washer and dryer and, and so I can have more time on the computer. <laughs> There's something, something's lost again, isn't it?
So uh, sim- simplification. Uh, monasticism is meant to be simplifying one's lifestyle, the way one lives. Now this is moving towards simplicity rather than complexity, because we're already so complicated. You know, we're you know we're, we're, we're very like a, a sticky web of complication. One's mind, my mind used to be like, I used to define it as a sticky web of complication. They just see everything stuck to it. <clears throat> so then, with this simplicity, going to the one or the ekagata, then is, is in this ability to recognize here and now. It's very simple, isn't it? It's not a complicated, highly technical thing, uh, uh, you know, that the Buddha is pointing at. But it is, you know, the, it's subtle. And, and our mind, the more complicated, we're, the more we're lost in complications and we, we, we have no subtlety. We can't, we can't see anymore because the mind is continually occupied with more and more thoughts and complicated views and opinions and desires and habits. <clears throat> So for me now, just like listening, this is my practice, and relaxing. Opening, the sense of receiving life. Welcoming. Because of the tendency, my personal tendency is to resist. You know, try to get rid of things. So I use, in, to counterbalance that tendency is to open or welcome. Like when, when complicated things come my way, problems in the Sangha and so forth, uh, my first reaction, a big reaction is, oh no, not another problem. Oh my God. Why is it always somebody causing a problem? Jesus. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the, that's the personality. I don't want any problems. I just want simple life and don't want any problems of anything and why do people always have to make life difficult and be so stubborn and then not complain like that? And that's my personality easily moves into that one, you see. <clears throat> so then, because of that, then I develop this upaya of welcoming. Seeing it as an opportunity rather than as oh, just another problem, another difficult thing to deal with that I don't want, seeing it as opportunity. Because it is, you know, the, the movement of life is, uh, you know, if we're open to it, we keep learning. If, we, if we're trying to, you know, I just want a simple life and no problem, then that, then we kind of whinge our way through life and always trying to, every time life gets a bit complicated or stressful, we, we complain and want to go somewhere else and so forth. <clears throat> so, so just noticing, you know, like, because I tend to do this, then, then the upaya I create is this uh, welcome. And just thinking, you know, well, what is welcoming? Something I don't want. No, I don't want any problems on a personal level. 
So I use the uh, welcome, you know, and I, I kind of look at it in a different way, try to change the perspective from just this, I don't want this, to welcome, you know, there's something to learn from. So I found this helpful, skillful means of, of receiving what I don't want personally. So just note, you know, this is how you, you know, you're, you're creating skillful means or upayas according to, you know, how you know yourself. What, if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, what, what kind of obsessions or blind spots do you have? And, and you're the one that knows, really. You have to admit it and see it it's like this. Then the, the skillful means, how to deal with it. You know, if I'm, Saying, "Oh no, I don't want any." Then I realize this, this, uh, you know, is not skillful. Just operating from, I don't want to be bothered with anything difficult. To welcoming, and then see what happens. You know, see what is the result of of that. Well, I find the result is, you know. <coughs> I'm, you know, I, I, it reminds me, I'm, I'm with the Dhamma. I'm not just, I'm not caught in this, it's a very unpleasant, uh, mental state to be attached to. It's, oh no, I don't want this, and why do people have to be so, diff- and that kind of thing. This is not a mental state that I enjoy. You know, it's not one I want to cultivate, but it is a habit of the mind. Because if I get lost in that, then, you know, it's, I, it, it just, it, it, it multiplies. It, it takes me over. So, so this is where, you know, seeing the, the pain, the suffering from, from just being attached and lost in this, in this habit of whinging and complaining uh, to welcoming. No, I find I'm, I can rise up to things. You know, if there's something in me that's that's quite, you know, solid and strong and willing to take life on and not just complain and whine when when it isn't going the way I want it to. And then I think that's, I like that side of me, that kind of noble, brave side. I like that. But the wind, you know, oh no, I can't stand it too much. <laughs> this is not, this is not what I want to be, you know, this is not how, I, this is not a state of mind I want to hold to. Because when I really look at it, it's just uh, unpleasant, isn't it? It's really misery to, to be lost in that, that kind of thinking. But it's not a kind of brave heart type of thing I'm asking you to do, but, you know, skillful means the way, but it does have this sense of, of being, you know, of being a, an individual who, who is uh, willing to take life and learn from it, rather than someone who's trying to get away from everything because it's too much to bear. And other morning's reflection about suicide bombers. I had some been some discussion about this. What I meant, I wasn't condoning that <clears throat> because uh, you know you're using suicide as a way of harming others, which I find morally unacceptable. You know, so if I'm doing something, killing myself in order to kill other 
innocent people in I don't find that inspiring at all. But what I was pointing to is that in, uh, you know, the sacrificing oneself for a cause, there's something quite inspiring about that. Like sacrificing your life for your brother or your family or something, you know, is uh, self-sacrifice. <clears throat> In which you, you know, you're not, you're not sacrificing yourself to harm others, but to save others. So in, uh, I imagine that suicide bombers, you know, in, you know, as convoluted as their thinking must be, it's, there is a sense of, you know, it's for a cause of, you know, of the Palestinian people or things like this. So there's, it's not just a malicious uh, desire to harm innocent people or some demonic force, but it is, it can be deluded, it's deluded, yes, but it's uh, uh, also probably, with most of them, a sense of self-sacrifice. <clears throat> so when people are oppressed, like Palestinians tend to be, then they're, then they have, then they tend to use any means to fight back. And they're, since they're not wealthy and uh, powerful, they use themselves. I mean, it's pathetic, isn't it? It's very sad to to see that that they that's the only way they can they can protest is by suicide. <coughs> that's very sad, really. Because when you're facing, uh, you know, an oppressive force that has, is much more powerful and advanced than you are, then what do you do? So this is where, you know, modern life is, you know, you see the, the problems of the world very much about the inequalities of the wealthy and the poor now. This is, this is, this is a reflection, this isn't, the Ajahn Tomato's political views. But, uh, you know, you see that, that the terrorist movement, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, there's a, a tremendous inequality of wealth. And, uh, you know, the Western world, we're de- bound and determined to see that we, Keep ours and increase it at the expense of the other. So, you know, it's not, we, you know, this is, this is where we need to look at the, at the, and what that does. You know, it just creates resentment, anger, and envy and desire, you know. So you find more and more economic refugees, people trying to, to, go into wealthy countries because wealth is as a kind, they want some of it too and uh, that's natural to, you know wealth is attracts <laughs> so uh, and yet we're you know, we've got to keep them out <laughs> kind of feeling <laughs> build the walls and, and, and let, you know, keep the vulgar hordes away So this is this is the dualistic structure again, you know, in the of thinking and me and you. Where in terms of Dhamma, you know, the, we we recognize the common bond of dukkha um, that we all share with the poor, the rich. It's not a, you know, we're not in a position of condemning the West or the wealthy or that, but pointing. The causes of suffering are due to what? Um, Islamic terrorists? Is, uh, can, are they the target? Are they what we can put all our blame on? Or is it even in the way we think about ourselves? You know, aren't we all involved in this in some way? Of course, this is probably dangerous 
you know, at a time where they probably think of me as a terrorist, <laughs> even suggesting that maybe, you know, you know, one bringing into consciousness this this uh, this problem where with human human beings, isn't it? There's always balancing. Nature is always seeking a balance. And there's so many human beings on the planet now, more than there ever has been in any known time. You know, the planet is uh, chock a block with humanity. So, how are we going to live with each other? Is the question. How are we going to survive and share the wealth and the necessities? You know, with so many humans. And then there is control, you know, build up big defense systems, dominate, be, you know, uh, uh, use our power to protect ourselves as the kind of ignorant reaction of superpowers, isn't it? Use our power to protect ourselves, keep them out, keep them away, don't let them in. Or try to make them, you know, follow us, you know, browbeat them into conformity. So, this is, you know, this is ignorance and uh, understandable, you know, understand the, that reaction. But now they were in this state of reflecting on the way things are and the, the causes of suffering and that so we're, you know, we're, we can uh, develop wisdom and it's very much needed at this time, wisdom. There isn't, you don't see it operating in any active way in the international scene or socially. The wisdom is not not a very apparent. There may be few individuals at best. So in terms of, you know, what we can offer as individuals is is what we're doing now, isn't it? Open it really getting to the cause, the root causes of suffering and uh, and the realizing uh, the the way of non-suffering in our own conscious experience of life. So that this awakening uh, of individuals is, is like this retreat, this Buddhist teaching is for that. It's to awaken because this is part of our humanity. We have this this potential. We don't have to be just blind followers in the vulgar herd. So I also appreciate what what you are doing yourself, your own efforts in this direction. You know, there's something to to uh, recognize in yourself is something you know what brings you here and and uh, interests you and inspires you and and keeps you here. What is it that that uh, you know that you have this 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 kind of inclination? You say this is something to to treasure in yourself. Not just, oh, I'm tired of the world, I want to get out of it, I just can't stand it anymore. Even though one can entertain such thoughts. But is that really, you know, maybe that might be a, some kind of reaction you might have at times, but recognize that the, that the, this, this being human, this 
humanity that we share has this potential and we all sense it or intuit it in a way the potential and the possibility for this liberation when you think about it on a conditioned plane of self then it seems very remote so that's why you can't believe it you know you can't believe your personal reactions or habits because they're conditions that that have been uh, created out of ignorance of the Dhamma. So this is where now you're you're uh, opening to the reality, to Dhamma. Trust that, and then then uh, the wisdom flows through these forms. You know, wisdom is is through Dhamma, not through personal attainments or achievements. And then the the you know the more humanity, the more human individuals develop wisdom, that that potential increases for the rest. Somebody asked me once, "Do you believe there are arahants in the Himalayas, like the Theosophists say, or that there are enlightened beings living in?" remote places and saints and you know the cynical mind wants to that's all just what I think well I hope so because if there weren't the world would probably be a lot worse off than it is <laughs> that if there were no enlightened beings no clear minded individuals left on the planet it would prob- probably be much worse. <clears throat> so, so you know, it's not, the, the, but then this is waiting for, you know, worshipping arahants, unknown arahants in the Himalayas. It's all right, you know, I'm not, but it's not, li- it won't be liberating for you. Uh, it's certainly better than worshipping neo-Nazis or anything like that. But, but uh, recognize that that when we want to do something to help the world, this is this is what we're doing now is is very significant. It's a it's an offering, and, and because you're getting to the root, the very basis of where ignorance starts. It's not just a idealistic. Let's share the wealth with with the poor. But it's it's getting beyond the the sense of separation, where the we care. You know, we have a sense of concern and interest in 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 helping on that level of just material, of, you know, sharing the material wealth so that people have, you know, enough to to live on. And there isn't this, you know, uh, incredible gap, which is going to, you know, as long as that gap remains, there's always going to be, you know, we, we, the rich always have to build walls around themselves to survive. You have to build a castle, a fortress, to protect your well, because that, because the, you know, that's that's creating an imbalance.